A very good morning to everybody. I hope everybody is bright and fresh for today's session. So with that, we start the first session for today. The chairpersons for this session will be Dr. Rekha Mittal. Dr. Rekha Mittal is a senior pediatric neurologist working at Rainbow Children's Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Vinay Goyal, a professor of neurology at Ames. Uh, Sir's special interests include movement disorders and neuroinfectious diseases. And Dr. Rakesh Singh is a pediatric uh, pediatrician practicing in Gurgaon. I request all the chairpersons to kindly come on stage and take over. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I want to thank Shefali for this invitation. I'm happy to be here. And to keep the program in time, I would like to invite the first speaker, uh, Dr. Michel Chevel, and he is uh, going to speak about evaluation of developmental delay in clinic, current approaches. And Dr. Michel is the uh, inaugural Harvard uh, GEDA chair in pediatrics. He's a chair of Department of Pediatrics. McGill Faculty in Medi Faculty of Medicine, Pediatrician in Chief, Montel Children Hospital, and uh, uh, he's from Canada. Good morning. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, the slides are up. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could turn out early for uh, for this talk. Once again, I would like to uh, thank Professor uh, Shafali Gulati for the kindness of this invitation to come here and join you for this particular uh, conference. I'm going to be discussing a common challenge in um, developmental pediatrics, and that's the evaluating developmental delay in the clinic, and what are our current approaches. I just wanted to give you a, uh, a, a classical photograph of McGill University and to prove to you that it's not always winter in uh, Canada. Um, Developmental delay, a common reason for referral to pediatrics, developmental pediatrics, child neurology, and sometimes even our psychiatric colleagues get these referrals. It's a challenging assessment for the clinician because it's quite time and labor intensive. It's not discreetly symptom focused like much of what we do when we're asked to evaluate a headache or a gait disturbance. It has multiple objective uh, no two cases are exactly alike. It's very varied according to the situation and the context. It often, as I like to say, is not a snapshot evaluation, but a moving picture evaluation that takes place over time. And unfortunately for the child and family, there really are no easy solutions to the challenge of developmental delay. There are certain fundamental aims in the assessment of a child with developmental delay. I like to say that the first and foremost is to confirm that indeed the child had a developmental delay and what type of neurodevelopmental disability it is. Really at the end of your assessment you should be able to specify the specific neurodevelopmental disability subtype. I think also as physicians I like to tell my residents that MD doesn't necessarily stand for medical doctor, it stands for medical detective. Our main job is to figure out why a particular child has a particular problem. So we need to search carefully for an underlying and responsible etiology or cause. And that means not doing a whole gamut of investigation, but rather selecting our investigations in a rational, expeditious, and up-to-date way. We also need to ensure that the child gets seen by appropriate rehabilitation services and get those interventions. We need to counsel the family about the underlying diagnosis and what it means for the future. 
and if there's a genetic implication, if it might have happened again in that particular family. And in addition, we need to identify and manage any associated medical or behavioral or even social condition that limit that child realizing his or her full potential. So what are neurodevelopmental disabilities? They are related, chronic, ideologically heterogeneous brain-based disorders. And what they all share as an essential feature is a significant disturbance in one or more recognized developmental domains. These may be the motor domain involving both gross and fine motor skills. It might be in the speech and language domain, in social domain, cognitive skills, and in activities of daily living. If you look in the textbook, you'll see a number of different neurodevelopmental disorders that have been identified, and each of them deserve their own talk lasting at least an hour, if not more. Global <laughs> developmental delay and intellectual disability will be the focus of this particular presentation. There's also the most common physical disability in childhood, which is a neuromotor impairment that we call cerebral palsy. Autism spectrum disorder is an increasingly prevalent neurodevelopmental disability in our society. Developmental language impairment, gross motor delay, or other neurodevelopmental disabilities. And we also have three that are more or less at the school age population. This is developmental coordination disorder, learning disability, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So what do we mean when we say global developmental delay? What is the definition? The definition of global developmental delay is a significant functional delay in at least two or more of those developmental domains I highlighted. The delay is apparent when it's compared to it in a standardized, norm-referenced way to that child's chronologic peers. It's a term that is typically applied to and restricted to children less than five years of age. And it's consistent with how parents frame their concerns. No parent comes to a primary care provider or a pediatrician saying that their child has a cognitive delay. Rather, what they come is a question about function. The question usually is, why is my child not walking? Why is my child not speaking? And global developmental delay attempts to encapsulate those concerns and also uh, frame a evaluation and intervention format. Intellectual disability, it refers to limitations in adaptive behaviors and skills. These skills may be conceptual, they may be social, they may be practical. Intellectual disability is present from an early age it persists across the lifespan into adolescence and to adulthood, represents a deficit in general intellectual functioning. It's not present in one environment only, but it's in cross all environments that a child may find him or herself in, whether that be in the home, in a school, and in the computer in a community. And systems of support are required in order to maximize the function and participation of that particular individual in society. When we're evaluating intellectual disability, it requires considerable sensitivity to cultural and linguistic context, especially in a multi-ethnic society, in, in order to have an accurate assessment and diagnosis. Intellectual disability used to be defined in terms of an IQ test a simple number that was given, and we can debate for hours whether an IQ test truly measures intelligence or not. But right now, IQ scores are not sufficient in and of themselves to give a diagnosis of an intellectual disability. They really are supportive of a diagnosis. I like to say, think of, you know, in IQ score, they used to say more than two and a half standard deviation below the mean would be a diagnostic of an intellectual disability. That would be an IQ score of 70, but for practical purposes, what is the difference in an individual between an IQ score of 70 and an IQ score of 69? We certainly wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those two individuals. Intellectual disability is typically a term that's applied to children older than five years of age, 
It has replaced the term mental retardation, which no longer should be used uh, by uh, medical and health professionals and by the general public or government agencies. And it is synonymous now with an intellectual developmental disorder. So as you can see from these two definitions, they are related complementary disorders, global developmental delay and intellectual disability. And they are situationally framed, and they're also framed by, by time in the development of a particular individual child. They're often overlapping, but they're not quite necessarily synonymous. Yes, it is true that many children with a global developmental delay, if you have the privilege of following them into uh, school aid, will manifest a later intellectual disability. And if you're able to take a time machine and go back in time, many individuals with an intellectual disability will have been originally and previously diagnosed with a global developmental delay. In terms of detecting developmental delay, there really are two strategies. One strategy is developmental screening. That is population-wide, systematic, standardized assessment of all children. There's a variety of assessment tools. Some of these are parental checklists. Some of these parental checklists can be automated and made web-based or be done on a tablet or a laptop. Other developmental screening tools are child evaluations that are quick and standardized and systematic. The problem with developmental screening is that it's not very cost effective. You have to screen all children to find about two or three percent of the population that merit a diagnosis of a global developmental delay or an intellectual disability. And in addition, there is a high frequency of false positives which then lead to inappropriate resource allocation, inappropriate additional testing, evaluation, uh, diagnostic workup, et cetera. Plus there's considerable parental anxiety to be associated with being told on a screening test that your child has a developmental delay or an intellectual disability, but then further detailed testing did not support that screening evaluation. So developmental screening is not a way to go about detecting the disorder. But rather, it, we, we have put the emphasis on developmental surveillance. And that involved the active engagement with parents. And after all, you know, parents know their child best. I mean, the first rule of pediatrics is a mother is always right. Second rule of pediatrics is a father is right if he has a list from, his, from the mom. And these, uh, we actively engage with the parent to elicit any developmental concerns that then prompt a selective detailed assessment. Children are seen by their primary care providers at regular intervals as part of primary pediatric care and preventative management. So for timing of vaccination at six months, a year, 18 months, and 24 months, are good times in a young child's life to engage in developmental surveillance and ask the parent questions about development and any concerns they might have. We do know that earlier detection of developmental delay leads to earlier diagnosis and intervention and improved later outcome, however measured. We have also in North America emphasized targeting particular populations at high risk for global developmental delay and intellectual disability. And it's not hard to figure out what these at-risk populations are in the pediatric age group. These are principally neonatal intensive care unit survivors. The prematurely born infants, especially those that are extremely premature or born with a very extreme small birth weight, term-born children who have suffered asphyxia or distress at the time of birth and delivery, children born with a congenital heart disease, and that represents about 1% of the childhood population, children with congenital anomalies, and children with suspected genetic syndrome. Another targeted population would be children who have social adversity, one-parent household, low socioeconomic status, parents with mental health challenges, 
and children who are in a family which have already had a child with a global developmental delay or intellectual disability. So these are our target population that we tend to focus on and have special clinics uh, in order to uh, enhance developmental language. They're babbling at six months, they're turning to name at nine months, they're saying a single word other than mama or dada at 12 months, they're pointing consistently to indicate wants, desires, or needs between 12 to 15 months, and they're speaking in two word phrases between 18 to 24 months, and they're generally asking for money by the age of five. What are some red flags for developmental delay? Well, if a child is not rolling by six months, not sitting by nine months, and certainly not walking by 18 months, that is a child with a motor delay who merits further assessment and investigation. Early definitive handedness under the age of one is also a sign of a motor impairment and maybe an early tip off to cerebral palsy. In terms of language, no words or pointing by 12 months, no two word phrases by 24 months is also a red flag for language delay meriting further assessment. Social clues to developmental delay, a lack of consistent eye contact and engagement with others, repetitive behavior, the desire for sameness, no seeking out of play behavior with other children, no interactive play or no pretend play by 18 to 24 months. And in addition, the child who has experienced a non-febrile seizure under the age of two is also at high risk for developmental delay and all the children that you see for a suspected epilepsy in that age group should also be developmentally assessed and screened. When we evaluate these children in the clinic, what do we do? Well, the basics are still good enough for figuring it out most of the time. A good three-generation family history with a special emphasis on neurodevelopmental disorders, ethnicity of the parents because some disorders do tend to clustify and cluster in specific ethnic groups, Parental consanguinity may raise a red flag for a recessive genetic disorder or a metabolic disorder. In terms of pregnancy, labor, and delivery, I like to know whether they've had any prenatal care, any maternal illnesses or adversity, if there's any, been any regular alcohol, drug, or tobacco use, any intrauterine infections, and how was fetal growth and integrity as assessed on antenatal ultrasound. Then in terms of delivery, whether it was preterm or term, spontaneous or induced, augmented or assisted, whether there was any vaginal delivery to suggest an abruptia or a previa, whether there were any documented fetal heart rate abnormalities to suggest fetal distress during labor and delivery, whether there was a need for a C-section, and especially if that C-section was an urgent C-section that was not anticipated uh, it raises concern as opposed to an elective C-section that is scheduled as a result of a prior cesarean section. In the newborn period, we want to know about birth weight, APGAR scores, if there was any need for case room resuscitation, if there was a need for an admission to a, NIC, a NICU and how that child did in the NICU, and if there was any neonatal encephalopathy in the term-born infant with particular reference to seizures and feeding difficulties. Past medical history is of interest related to chronic conditions, uh, current medications, any previous hospitalizations or surgical procedures, and I'd like to get a good handle on the child's social status in terms of the socioeconomic status of the parent, their degree of education to get an idea of how much stimulation that child is getting in the home environment, whether the family unit is still whole, whether both parents are still involved in care, if not, who had custody of that child and if there's been any youth protection as a result of allegations of child abuse or child neglect. When taking the history of a developmental delay, I find that the students and residents struggle with it, but it's really not that difficult. You want to know what was the initial domain of concern 
And at what age were the parents first concerned that their child was just not right? In this age of mom and tot program, mothers are frequently exposed to other children of the same age of their child and can compare whether or not their child is progressing at a good pace or at an expected pace. You want to know about progress across all domains. You want to get a handle on where the child is at currently in terms of development and function. An important thing to get is whether there was any regression or loss of skills. Regression may highlight a neurodegenerative process. Often these are genetically determined and it's important to make the diagnosis early uh, so as to prevent any further recurrences. You want to get a handle on any autistic features in terms of eye contact, desire for sameness, uh, tactile defensiveness, uh, failure to engage in play. Uh, you also want to know if there's been any previous developmental assessments or laboratory investigation and what services are, previous, are currently being provided so that you don't duplicate these services and investigation. Many children with a developmental delay will have other problems. Uh, you want to make sure that they hear and they see. Well, these things are remediated by either hearing aid and, and amplification or by corrective lenses. You want to make sure that there are no paroxysmal events that may be suggestive of epilepsy, any behavioral difficulties, or any sleep disturbances. Increasingly, both of these are being identified as major issues in these children that are quite challenging to the family unit. And I think in the next few years, we'll see more and more literature and studies addressing these two specific topics. The physical examination is basically one first of a hands-off observation. You know, don't put your hands on the child until the last possible moment. I always like to give the child an opportunity to play in the office, and while I'm talking to the parents, uh, you, uh, one eye is on, the, is on making contact with the parent, but the other eye is, is, uh, is looking at that child and seeing how the child uses various toys and how, to ba how the infant sort of explores the environment around them. You want to make sure that there's proximity between the child and the caregiver, I tell the residents, never get between a child and a, a parent. That's kind of like getting between a, a mother bear and a cub, not a good idea to do. And I always, even if the child is pre-verbal, will tell the child what is about to happen to him or her. On the general examination, what are we interested in? Dysmorphic features that may suggest a particular syndrome, however, uh, don't call a child dysmorphic until you've seen both parents. I always ask, did the child resemble one parent or the other? You want to make sure you're not missing a big liver, a big spleen, no cutaneous stigmata that may suggest a neurocutaneous disorder or phacomatosis. You always want to have a good look at the complete spine to make sure that there are no cutaneous defects and that is straight. In the neurological examination, I find the one thing that's most often overlooked, especially by our trainees, is measuring a head circumference. And they often will measure it, but they don't plot, and they don't plot it. And if the head circumference is below the second or above the 98th percentile, I tell them to measure the head circumference of the parents, because the most common cause of small-headedness or big-headedness is familial. And in terms of the specific neurological examination, you want to test the integrity of the cranial nerve, visual field, whether there's any nystagmus, whether there's any facial paresis, when there's evidence of hearing integrity and orientation to sound, whether there's any excessive drooling or dysarthria. You want to observe to make sure that there's no lateralizing features between one side or the other, looking for abnormalities in muscle tone, bulk, and strength, always check the stress and primitive reflexes, reaching is a good idea to see if there's any dysmetria, gait is important to look at, I always make them walk if they're ambulatory, place a toy on the ground, see how they stoop and they recover to get an idea of their, of their proximal limb girdle strength, 
And I always lie them down on the ground and see them get up to see if they have a Gower sign or not. The developmental assessment, again, I emphasize most of that comes true in that observation for play when they first come into the office. In terms of gross motor, you want to see them sitting, gait, stooping, and recovering. I always like to situate my office near a flight of stairs so I can see them going up or down stairs, having them run down a hall, jump in place, hop in place. All of these are good assessments of gross motor skills in the office setting. In terms of fine motor, it's the manipulation of a toy, pen and paper task, ball playing, and language is following command, pointing, identifying body parts, colors, shapes, uh, identifying the meaning of common objects, uh, listening to them give a short narrative about what they did, what they like to do, gives you an idea of sentence structure and whether they use pronouns and plural. Social, you're looking at the interaction with you. Uh, are they more interested in your uh, instrument, in your stethoscope, and in your reflex hammer than in you yourself as a person? That would indicate a lack of a theory of mind, which is common to individuals with an autistic spectrum disorder. You want to get an idea of eye contact, any repetitive behaviors, obsessive behaviors, how aware are they emotionally of their surroundings, how appropriate are they from an emotional perspective. Cognitive, in the child above the age of two, I asked about colors, shapes, uh, whether they can demonstrate an understanding of very simple concepts, short and long, big and small, on and under, open and closed. I often ask them about analogies. Daddy is a boy, mummy is a fire is hot, ice is, those type of things, and then also get them to tell a short story about what they did that day or what they like to do at home, what games they like to pay, et cetera. And then in the office, you can get an idea if they're oppositional, if they're hyperactive, if they engage in any repetitive behaviors or stereotypies that you often see in autistic spectrum disorder. You also get an idea of the activities of daily living from the caregiver with respect to feeding, dressing, self-hygiene, and toileting. So the first visit goal in developmental delay is to assign the neurodevelopmental disability subtype to discuss this with the caregivers and then do some targeted intervention that are very highly dependent on a specific subtype. You always make sure that the referrals are made to appropriate rehabilitation services, and I always arrange for a second visit in six to nine months to review the developmental trajectory, make sure that these rehabilitation services are indeed in place, and to review the results of the investigation done. Principally, global developmental delay and intellectual disability affect about 2 to 3 percent of the population. Two-thirds of them are mild to moderate. Males tend to be more affected than females. The sex ratio is about 1.4 to 1, and that reflects the influence of X-linked disorders. There is a rising rate of global developmental delay and intellectual disability with declining socioeconomic status. Uh, some people say that may be a bias of our ascertainment methods. Uh, the gender and socioeconomic status bias applies to mild to moderate but not severe cases. I mentioned before that comorbidities are frequent in this population. The big one is epilepsy or convulsive disorders, which can be a challenge for the neurologist to manage. There may be attentional limitations which limit their uh, utilization or the gain from rehabilitation intervention, sensory impairment, and increasingly mental health issues and behavioral challenges are highlighted in this population. The North American population has been estimated that a single individual with a global developmental delay or intellectual disability, even of the mild to moderate category, will have an additional lifetime cost in terms of medical care, education, rehabilitation, lost income of about a million U.S. dollars. The etiologies of these conditions are diverse and heterogeneous. There's a spectrum of congenital and acquired causes. 
An etiology in our clinic can be identified in about two-thirds. I saw that there's an abstract and a poster being presented later which suggests that up to 90% of cases in one clinic here, they were able to identify an underlying cause. I'll be very interested to see that poster later. And about 25 to 50% of identified causes are genetic in origin, and that percentage is only going to increase as we apply whole exome and whole genome sequencing to this population. There's a number of guidelines and algorithms established to aid the practitioners in terms of what tests you should do. Investigation should routinely involve a CAPGAS, a lactate, a CK, thyroid function, especially if there's significant early growth motor delay and weakness. Chromosomal microarray or comparative genomic hybridization has replaced carrier type as a way of looking for genetic, looking for DNA copy duplications or uh, deletion. There's first tier metabolic screening, and I'll mention that in a, in a minute or so. Uh, FMR1 triplet repeat testing for fragile X is applicable in both genders. In severely affected females with microcephaly, MECP2 testing for Rett syndrome is recommended. All of these children should be imaged with an MRI scan, with a three Tesla scan, preferable to 1.5 Tesla. And if there is a strongly suspected etiology after, he after history and physical examination, then you do some targeted uh, genetic testing. EEG is not routinely recommended unless there's a coexisting paroxysmal disorder suspected. There's a number of different articles in the literature to help you. This one from Neurology in 2011. This one from, um, how do you get rid of that? I'm almost finished. Then there is uh, this one from the Annals of Neurology in 2013. This is from Pediatric 2014 for the comprehensive genetic evaluation of children with intellectual disability or global developmental delay. And this one is on the metabolic evaluation of these children. And uh, this is also from 2014. I just wanted to bring up a made in Canada intervention about metabolic disorders. Metabolic disorders are individually rare. None of us can remember all of them beyond the examination uh, when we're tested for our certification. Uh, they're individually rare, but they're collectively responsible for about 1 to 2 percent of cases. They're increased in the context of parental consanguinity or a previously affected child. They may cluster in certain ethnic uh, groups. But what's important is that uh, 85 of these disorders are potentially treatable and two-thirds of them can be identified by routine, low-cost, standardized screening. There is a smartphone app that you can download, either on your Android or on your Apple phone, which will help guide you to the treatable metabolic causes. I put the website there where you can find it, but just go to the App Store, and it's called Tide BC, Treatable Inherited, it, Treatable Dis intellectual disability in BC for British Columbia, where it comes from. And this generally recommends this profile of first-tier metabolic testing uh, that can be done. These generally are low cost. Uh, they're not fancy. They're routinely available. And they will pick up about two-thirds of those 85 treatable metabolic uh, disorders. If there's no diagnosis after a variety of the testing that I just mentioned, Increasingly, people are using next generation sequencing using intellectual disability panel, which can include over 450 genes. And these are commercially available, it depends on where you are, what gene panel is available. Uh, further metabolic testing usually requires a high level of diagnostic suspicion, as well as the input of our colleagues in genetics and often invasive CSF sampling or single gene testing. Increasingly now I'm using the next generation sequencing panel when I, I left with a child with an unexplained diagnosis for intellectual disability or global developmental delay. 
But clearly, microarray and the next generation sequencing panels are really a placeholder, and there's no doubt that the whole genome and whole exome sequencing, exome sequencing all the coding sequences, whole genome, all the DNA sequencing, will uh, rapidly replace these in the next five to ten years as costs come down, and uh, they will be increasing our diagnostic uh, yield. So on the second visit, it's an integral part of the assessment. We want to make sure that there had been progress to rule out a neurodegenerative disorder. We want to be sure that rehabilitation services are in place. We want to validate our initial assessment of a neurodevelopmental disability subtype. We want to make sure that we've looked at what the results of the investigations and whether there's any specific diagnosis has come up, whether there's any need for further testing, and of course there needs to be a lot of communication to the caregivers regarding the diagnosis, the subtype, the etiology, and what the future might hold. We also need to be sure that we've identified relevant comorbid conditions that may require further ongoing follow-up by, uh, by neurologists or developmental pediatricians, and then family counseling is a big part of what we do in the office on the second and any subsequent visit. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I believe, do we take questions now? Do we take? I think. Okay, so I'll be Thank happy you, Dr. Shivil, for a now. wonderful overview on developmental delay. Uh, I also uh, see that uh, we should look at other siblings who are developing in the, in the family because uh, we have a lot of patients who come from rural background and they sometimes can't tell you the real timeline, how was the development of the child. But if you ask them simple question, how was the other child? Was this child slower than the other one? That also helps us to know that this child is not yeah. doing as well as the other one. I know, you, you really told not to compare one child to the next, but especially if, if a parent has already had one child, they're able to tell you whether or not they're doing yes. the same thing. Yes. Another way to do it is parents often, everybody videotapes their kid now. Yes. That, especially at a first birthday party or, yes. or a second birthday party, and it also gives you an idea of where the child is at in terms of developmental and, and functional skills. So those type of things are actually excellent clues to help you. And do you think the, there is a difference in the development of children who are developing now more in the nuclear family rather than the classical setup of joint family, which was more common in India, and the families are getting more nuclear and nuclear? So do well, you think, because that sometimes creates a problem. Is this a really a developmental delay or a little slower delay? I mean, slow development. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's the question is often, you know, is this a disorder or is this simply a delay and yes. the kids cash up? Yes. Certainly there's a subset of kids that do, quote, cash up. But even if they cash up, like especially in the area of language, they're at risk for later uh, challenges. Like I, I, in my experience, kids who are language delayed invariably are the no, kids no. that have learning disability, clearly have attentional challenge or academic challenges later on. Yes. If there are any questions from the house now? Uh, would you like to comment on uh, cell phone usage? Cell phone use? Yeah, affecting uh, the yes. kids because it's a, and, and it's television. a big question. Yeah, well actually the, the, both the, um, the Canadian Pediatric Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics has all, have come out with no screen time under the age of two. Uh, I, I think that's a bit radical to be quite honest. I mean, um, there's a lot that kids can learn from yes. appropriate content on the cell phone or on a tablet or on a laptop. Uh, I'm also amazed at you know, how quickly and intuitively they understand, much better than us old folks, how to, how to navigate, et cetera. But again, it's, it's all things in moderation. It should be done with a parent, and it should be done to sort of, what the di to me, what's the difference? You learn to identify the animals in a barnyard and what sound they make, yes. whether you do it from a, from a book or whether you do it from a yeah. laptop. So long, but more importantly, that you do it in the company of one parent or the other. 
Yeah, because the tendency is to use it as an electronic babysitter. Uh, I know. I mean, a lot, a lot of time it is a, it is a babysitter. I mean, it, it's basically, a, you know, I, I, we used to have a country house outside Montreal, and it would be an hour and a half drive, and when the kids were little, we had to entertain them from the front seat. Now I look and I see families have all the, you know, they're watching Finding Nemo, or they're watching yes. Frozen, or some other thing, and that keeps the child quiet. But you're right. I mean, it, it, it's all about stimulation, games, fun, you know, encouraging social contact. I, I remember sitting at, a, at an airport gate looking at a four-month-old, and that four-month-old basically was completely comfortable on a tablet, you know, sorting, moving, playing a game, etc. And, I, you know, that, that may be a skill set that will be a key 20, 30 years from now to a very good job, right? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shevel. I request my co-chair, Dr. Rikha, to invite the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shevel. Uh, so the next speaker will be Dr. Anup Verma. Uh, he's the National Secretary General of um, API, uh, IP, and um, he's uh, held many prestigious positions in various organizations. And um, the, uh, he also received a Doctor of the Year Award uh, in 2015 by the National IMA headquarters. So Dr. Anup Verma, please. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, respected Chairperson, Dr. Vinay Goyal, Professor uh, Rekha Mittal, eminent teachers sitting in the audience, Professor Vina Kalra, Madam, Dr. I.C. Verma, sir, Dr. M.K.C. Nair, and all learned friends. Thanks to Professor Sifali for offering me a very prestigious platform to share my views my experience on pediatric movement disorder. This is basically crafted for general pediatrician who are dealing, uh, seeing lot many cases. And this is out of an OPD of a general pediatrician. An approach to pediatric movement disorder. Well, I am going to talk for 20 minutes for the, the classification, the, the, the craft is this classification the phenomenology that the, uh, the way the child presents, the clinical pearls, this is very, very important for practical relevance, and a lot of videos from video galleries. And as a pediatric movement disorder, we know that most of the time we deal with hyperkinesias and the basal ganglia is mainly involved, and we have lot many hyperkinetic movement disorder as it is depicted in uh, this slide. See, all movement disorders can be grouped according to the speed of movement. You are seeing here, the fastest being the myoclonus, slightly slower will be the bellismus, then the chorea, then ethitosis, and the slowest is the, myo, uh, this, the dystonias. And this slide depicts that there is an overlap. You are rare to see a very pure sort of uh, plain movement disorder and overlap is more often the rule than exception in movement disorder. Athetosis, chorea, bellismus are in the same spectrum and differs only in the range of the movement. That is very important. And for a beginner, everything which surface appears to be a dolphin. So in movement disorder, video is worth a thousand picture. I cannot define an elephant unless I have seen once. And therefore, it is very important to see, to visualize the movement disorder. And then in the next, uh, next attempt, you are going to pick up it very nicely. And, uh, early. Movement disorder, when it differs from seizure, is they disappear during sleep. More stereotypic. There is no loss of consciousness, mostly in the, uh, loss, uh, in the movement disorder. And we don't have a classical EEG in any sort of movement disorder. And the different kind of dyskinetic phenotype, this is the stereotypy. You are seeing that rhythmicity is sometime 
Speed is variable, stereotypable. Suppressibility sometimes can be seen in stereotypy. Flapping, excitement, and stimulation are all seen in stereotypic and can be divided into a primary stereotypy. And he has seen is the common type, head nodding, and complex hand and arm movement that is again very important. And these are the list of secondary stereotypy. And you can go ahead with the autism, mental retardation, and so on. For making the diagnosis, visualization is very, very important. And these are all sort of primary stereotypy you are seeing. Head nodding stereotypy, again, we have very sort of head nodding stereotypy. Roman synapsis is there, basically related to the cerebellar uh, uh, agenesis, uh, vermian agenesis. Then we have spasmus newtons is there and various sort of head, head banging you are seeing here in the videos. And <clears throat> this is the uh, stereotypic manifestation. In girl, you are seeing a typical hand reading and writing movement you are seeing, and basically related to the MECP2 enzyme, which is, which is deficient in this. And this is a red syndrome. Look into my eyes and hear what I am not saying, for my eyes speak louder then my voice ever will. This is a classical red syndromes. And one more thing which is very classical of red is the very characteristic, very characteristic uh, uh, breathing pattern they have. What is this is the, the basically due to the dysautonomia. There is a imbalance of sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And this is, you can see, This is, a, this is a classical signature of disease. Then we have a complex hand and eye movement. Complex hand and arm movement in, in, in uh, infantile autism. Children with autism have more stereotypes than do equally delayed children without autism. That is again very important. Lot of movement disorder um, seen in sensory deprived child. This is a blind child exhibiting eye poking sort of movement, eye rubbing, eye pressing. This is what is called as the oculo-digital phenomena. Is in an attempt to stimulate the optic nerve so that they can have uh, some trace of light, some hope to see the light. That is important. This is basically attributed to the lack of stimulation means to reduce the tension. This is a self-injurious behavior we have seen with an increased uric acid level you are seeing. And a typical, this is a case of Leach-Nihan syndrome and you are seeing the typical rolling over of this patient across the floor. Not seen, not reported ever in Leach-Nihan syndrome. And <clears throat> more two important cause of self-injurious behavior is the fragile X chromosome where self-biting is present and Cornelia de Lange syndrome where the self-biting and face hitting is seen. Then there are certain orofacial lingual chewing movement which has observed after taking drugs after a week. And this is all tardive dyskinesia we are seeing the, here the child has taken medicine more than 15 days. And here there's a fly catcher tongue. This child is exhibiting, has received some drug for vomiting four months back. This is a tardive dyskinesia. And this is a peculiar sort of face rubbing, a stereotypic, very painful, very distressing. Continuous face as if there is a tumification was off was there. This is all drug induced. This is again uh, a secondary stereotypy, uh, rabbit syndrome, circum oral dyskinesias are there. Then there's a different dys dyskinetic ticks. You are seeing all varieties of tick here. You know that rhythmicity is not there in ticks. Your speed is very fast. Stereotypic variable manifestations are there, preceded by the sensation of urge or sensation above the shoulders and we know that when we talk of uh, ticks there are many overlaps for example we have Tourette syndrome we have ocds we have adsd and we know that whenever there is a presence of tick whether motor or vocal or phonic it is if it is less than one year it is a simple more than one year is chronic one and if the two motor ticks are there if focal or phonic ticks are more uh, present more than one year it is the 
Tourette syndrome, and we have an OCD cycle also, obsession, anxiety, compulsion, and relief. These are all uh, simple uh, examination, simple ticks, less than one year of age. This sort of presentation was more than one year. It was a chronic tick, and you are seeing here. This, this is the presence of motor tick, vocal tick, more than one year, present with children less than 18 years, and they have a tick-free interval no less than three months. You can listen the phonic one. And the important point to remember in ticks is rule of three. One third they disappear, one third are better, and one third they continue to exhibit ticks. Then psychiatric disorder. This child is continuous having an obsession to poke the fingers as if something is there in the uh, eyes. Eye specialist uh, surrendered. There, there is no problem. And to the tune that there is a whole complete lot of congestion and injury to the eyes. She had one more thing: trichotillomania is to pick, pick the hairs from the frontal region of the heart. See, this was all from the psychiatric OPD. Then comes the another, imp another important uh, is the dystonia. You are seeing here is the rhythmicity is not there in dystonias. Speed is very slow. Twisting and painful movement are very important in dystonia that you are seeing in all sort of these videos here. Then these are the causes of dystonia, the perinatal hypoxia and all. These are Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. This is again a very important uh, um, uh, condition which is leading to the dystonias. Yeah, you are seeing here hemidystonia, very related to the severe birth asphyxia, patient related admitted in the NICU, and you are seeing the hyperintensities in the putam. And the important thing is that hemidystonia is indicative of a structural abnormality in the brain. Uh, uh, whereas the generalized dystonia, if we see, there is possibility of idiopathic disorders are there. Then we post carnictus dystonia, as we are seeing here, there is a hyperkinetic movement disorder, impaired gaze is there, and bilirubin encephalopathy give rise to hyperintensity in the globus pallidus. So friends, dyskinetic CP is a common cause of non-progressive dystonia due to carnictus or birth asphyxia. Try low dose of levodopa in these patients. You may be surprised sometime so that uh, Segawas or DYT5 condition can be picked up. Then these are the videos of a patient who is exhibiting varieties of movement disorder. You are seeing here chorea. You are seeing vacuous smile is there. There is a hemidystonia. There is a twisting, uh, twisting uh, of the left upper arm, severe painful dystonia. And on examination, it is very, very important to see the eyes you are seeing a coppery pigmentation of, you will never see in a clinical practice grade four. And up to grade two, you can uh, ask your ophthalmic colleague to help you. And this is the P degree, ophthalmic P degree, just to show you the importance of three generation family history, which is very, very important, not only in moment disorder, but every sort of where the genetics comes into play. This is very classical um, MRI of the patient, of this patient, the, the, the panda sign was there. And neuroimaging, which is again important in movement disorder, you can have a basal ganglia calcification, farce and uh, pseudohypoparathyroidism. We have a basal ganglia hyperintensities can be seen in Wilson and Conductress. Then there are a lot many drug-induced dystonias. This is very young, and they mostly involve the head and neck. That is again where you are seeing here very severe, painful retrocolis, retrocolis like that. And these are the anti-aminitic and anti-psychotic drug that is the phenothiazine toxicity to the peak. Dystonia with this uh, agitation, aggression, and this xanthomas again give rise to xanthoma with dystonias. You can have a condition known as the cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. Here you are seeing a patient received some drug having a conjugated upward movement of the eyes with synergistic movement of the head, what is called as the oculogyric crisis. And you, you can remember all sort of dystonias of the, uh, by this uh, uh, wits, that is the vascular injury, infections, we have toxins, and we have as well. This patient came with some received some drug, absolutely painful condition, continuous protrusion of the tongue. Uh, this is the case of lingual dystonias. 
This is all sort of drug reaction. A patient with twisted uh, postures, bizarre, there's no family history, MRI was normal, it was an idiopathic torsion dystonia. And we know that generalized dystonia may always indicate the possibility of idiopathic nature. Here again, a very common condition uh, discussed in the PG classes is the chorea. It has a non-rhythmic, fast, stereotypic, uh, suppressible, it is not suppressible, and dance-like jerky movements are again important. And probably we always miss this type of presentation when the strap throat is in front of you, and we often miss this condition, and we do not treat adequately for 10 days antibiotic. And all post-steptococcal condition can be there in the form of sedanhams, can have a sturet, OCDs, and pans and pandas. These are the very classical presentation, very classical neurological signs of uh, chorea is the, if you ask the patient to extend the arms, there is a hyperextension of the metacarbophalangeal joint and the um, flexion and extension of the rib, what is known as the spooning sign or the piano sign. Here you are, child cannot sustain the protrusion of the tongue and it is due to the all, uh, due to the motor impersistence. This is the lizard or the darting tongue and we have, uh, if you ask the patient to hold the hand, hands up with the palm facing each other, the hypertonic limb jerks and hyperpronate, and this is the pronator sign. This is again, uh, if you ask the patient to grip your finger, you can feel there is a motor impersistence, the child is not able to continue pressure on. And friends, this is again a practical tip. All these signs are chorea specific and not the etiology specific. You can get all these signs in drug induced chorea. You can get these signs in other causes of the chorea, and this is important. From mild to severe form of chorea, one, once you can get, the, as for in this patient, you are seeing then they started with the mild chorea, very severe form is not able to sit. That is the chorea mollis. And after the treatment, the child is very uh, nicely. Uh, discharge. And 20% of these patients have hemichoria, you are seeing, and this patient, here is the patient who is exhibiting chorea, ataxia, and oculomotor apraxia. If you ask the patient to look laterally, instead of the moving the eyeball, he is moving all of the limb. This is oculomotor apraxia. See the eyes. You should not afford to miss the conjunctiva. That is valuable. This is the leash of conjunctival vessels there. And this is the Lewis bar or the adexia telangiectasia. Another important condition you are seeing is the sudden my jerks are there. This is the, the, the all sort of myoclonic. And sudden shock-like jerk is, is a, a condition known as the myoclonus. And you are seeing all this condition. This is a 15-month-old child in front of you. Extreme irritable, extreme irritable. Not able to sit, ataxic. And there's a mini myoclonuses are there. What is this? Yes. You are seeing a, a, a opsoclonus in this patient. This is a patient of opsoclonus, myoclonus syndrome. And uh, this... Uh, see that D2, the neuroblastoma was there, extracted out, discharge, you can see. And friends, there are, these are all picked up by means of abnormal eye movement. Therefore, it is very important to note this academia, that is the abnormal chaotic eye movements may be a post-viral or it is a paraneoplastic condition. Another very important dystonia is the falling backward. Falling backward is a by, as if it is a stressed by invisible string, is a classical example of SSP. You should not afford to miss, apart from the investigation of antibodies, antibody, and all that. Tremors, again, an important dyskinetic uh, phenotype is the rhythmicity, very fast, stereotypical, sinusoidal. These are all tremors. And tetrad of pallor, developmental delay, regression, skin uh, pigmentation, these are all features of, yes, IATS. And you are seeing a moment disorder, like a head, coarse head tremors are there, tongues moving, there is tremor of the tongue, and these are all, and where friends, you should remember that, a long-term coagulative, this is the follow-up of this patient for five years. You are seeing that long-term cognitive and language neurodeficit are all known in this center. Many times, this is again important, many times we see movement disorder being treated like a epileptic. Lot many times we are seeing a patient is exhibiting jerks and the patient is kept on Gardenhal, kept on Valparin, all sorts of 
um, problems were there. So this is, you are seeing, uh, 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 another developmental benign sort of movement disorder is the jitteriness, and you can see how simply this can be picked up. Just stop by holding the hand. Coming to the benign, you are seeing here, this is, uh, uh, you are seeing the jerks, and it is usually uh, resolved by the age of say six months, and this is again a benign condition. Shuddering, shivering, this is again a very important thing. A lot many times these are the, this gives a very a peculiar problem to, to the parents. You have to counsel that. These are all benign condition. This is again a benign idiopathic dystonia of infancy. You are seeing a segmental dystonia is here. Extreme <coughs> shoulder abduction, pronation, and, and there is a flexion of the wrist. This is a benign, and we have, we know that head nodding is again, uh, uh, comes into the benign. We have a paroxysmal tonic upgaze. These are all patient of paroxysmal tonic upgaze. You are seeing all benign. Here you are seeing torticollis. Here you are seeing head nodding and some tremors, uh, uh, nystagmus. Is what is this condition? Spasmus newtens. This is a benign condition. You are all, these are the all patient. And if it is a unilateral nystagmus, don't effort to miss the MRI. You may be uh, surprised to see the chiasmal malignancies. Then we have uh, various sort of posturing this patient exhibit. And these are all uh, infantile uh, masturbation or the gratification phenomena. <coughs> so this is all posturing during masturbation. And you have to counsel this patient, yes. Now, friends, the take-home message in this, uh, uh, in this sort of movement disorder group for practitioner, for the private practitioner, is follow the systematic approach. Is it a hyperkinetic or a hypokinetic? If it is a hyperkinetic, whether we have seen the spectrum of phenotype, dyskinetic phenotype, which, way, which uh, side it is fitting on, is family history, uh, very, very important, then the drug, in every patient who is coming with abnormal movement, always, always ask the history of drug, which is important. Respect the drug doses, but it is seen that even the normal doses can uh, have a presentation of a severe drug reaction. Mobile camera recording. When we started collecting the video in 1991, we have to bring the whole of lot of video, big cameras now. The patient is giving you a prepared food. This is important. Then follow-ups, again important. So friends, these all videos were all from a general pediatric OPD. The aim was to sensitize general pediatrician to pick up, to filter all these abnor abnormal movements on one side, give time, give uh, thought, pick up it, diagnose it properly, discuss in the scientific forum. And we need, for all this, what we need? We need a table, we need a chair, we need a stethoscope and nothing more than that. That is all. This was, he is a father of movement disorder, Jonathan Mink. Lot many <coughs> inspiration we have got from, from Sir Jonathan Mink. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Verma. That was a very, very good uh, presentation of the whole spectrum of movement disorders that we see. So, um, uh, any questions from the uh, audience, please? I think the videos were superb, and uh, everyone would have uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, the whole spectrum. So if there are no questions, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Biju Hamid, who's very well known in the world of pediatric neurology. And he's a consultant pediatric neurologist, and he leads the complex uh, movement disorders service at the Bristol Royal Children's Hospital in UK. And he's interested in neurotropins, in neuroprotection, and cell death mechanisms, and neuroplasticity and neuromodulation. Dr. Hamid, please. Thanks very much, um, Professor Mitchell um, and um, Dr. Goel, um, and thanks very much to 
Professor Gulathi for the kind invitation. And it's a privilege to be here in front of some of my old teachers, particularly Professor M. K. C. Naya, who I learned my developmental pediatrics from 30, 35 years ago. And it's quite nice to see you, sir, here. So um, I've got very little time, 20 um, minutes. And um, what I will try and do is um, give an overview of the current thinking um, on how to manage dystonia. And we had an excellent session on um, a feast of videos. Um, and dystonia, as you could see, is a very important, sorry, important problem. Um, and um, it's not new. It's been described many years ago by Oppenheim as dystonia muscularum deformance. But the thinking has moved on since from dystonia being a problem with managing your tone. So the current definition of dystonia is based on this consensus meeting which happened in 2013 um, under the auspices of the Dystonia Medical Research Foundation, the coalition, Dystonia Coalition and the European Dystonia Cooperation and Technology um, Forum. So dystonia is defined, as we can see, a movement disorder characterized by sustained or intermittent muscle contractions causing abnormal, often repetitive movements, postures, or both typically patterned and twisting and could be tremulous and often initiated or worsened by voluntary action and associated with overflow activation. So this is the current consensus definition for um, dystonia, which encompasses dystonia as well as, as we saw in the previous videos, the other coexisting clinical manifestations including tremor, including ataxia, etc. Now, childhood dystonia, the problem is the diagnostic evaluation is quite challenging. Why? Because of the phenotypic variability. And the etiology is quite heterogeneous. And the annoying thing is most of the pharmacological management um, that we have for dystonia, they prove refractory to it. And moreover, there's a huge incidence of adverse reactions to the various anti-dystonia medications. The current classification has again moved on to uh, an axis one and axis two, um, which deals with the clinical characteristics of dystonia. Again, this was in the consensus um, committee, which again into four um, domains, uh, the age at onset, the distribution, the temporal pattern, and the associated features. Axis two deals with the pathology and the inherited or acquired, um, et cetera. Dystonia, as we used to learn and we were taught, was we always thought it was a problem with the basal ganglia. But that doesn't seem to be the case anymore because increasingly we know that, as we see, the dystonia is not often isolated dystonia. There is often ataxia, there is often tremor, which all points towards the involvement of the cerebellum. Moreover, um, in the last five, six years, electrophysiological studies in um, animals have revealed uh, abnormal high frequency bursting activity in the cerebellar nuclei. And we know that if you do a partial cerebellectomy, it could improve the dystonia symptoms. So the, 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 all the work which has been done in the last decade or so points towards dystonia not being just a basal ganglia problem, but also cerebellum, involving cerebellum. So essentially, it is a problem with a distributed disorder of a network, which includes the basal ganglia, the cortex, the thalamus, and the, and the cerebellum. There are dystonia as a major feature in several cerebellar disorders, again pointing to the role of the cerebellum. So the if you look at the pathophysiology of dystonia, it, it mainly comes under three domains. One is the loss of surround inhibition. Um, which is often thought as the imbalance between the direct and the indirect pathways of the basal ganglia circuitry, because as we know, the direct pathway is the one which activates the thalamus, and then the indirect pathway is the one which puts the brakes on the thalamus so that the unwanted movement can be um, inhibited. So often dystonia was thought as a, an exaggeration of this direct pathway, while a problem with the indirect pathway where the exaggerated movements can't be stopped, but the bricks can't be put on the thalamus. So that is one pathophysiology. The, yet another uh, domain is in the impaired sensory motor integration. And this is very important, the role of the sensory motor system. 
um, in the pathophysiology of dystonia because we know about the, uh, the sensory tricks which are used in managing dystonia like the uh, GIST antagonist. The difficulty in discriminating sensory stimuli in focal patients with focal dystonia who seems to have impaired sensory stimuli discrimination, both in the spatial and temporal domains, and the sensory inputs modulating dystonic symptoms, as in the sensory tricks. The third aspect of pathophysiology, which is the current thinking, is that it is a maladaptive neural plasticity. So this is a very brief schematic representation of the anatomical substrates for dystonia, which, um, so on the left side, it shows the a very simplified representation which connects the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the brainstem nuclei, and the cerebellum, which all feeds into the cerebral cortex and direct output to motor neurons. But that's not just the case. In certain cases of cervical dystonia, for example, there seems to be a pathway where the midbrain, the interstitial nucleus of Kajal, is, seems to be the direct pathway. Um, even though the cortex is involved, but the final output seems to be through elsewhere, the, 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 the brainstem, which then projects into the, um, the neck, motor neurons in the, in the neck. So the pathways may differ according to the type of dystonia um, and may not necessarily inv or require involvement of the cerebral cortex. So it was thought to be an abnormal function of the basal ganglia circuits, the imbalance between the direct and the indirect pathways, as we can see here. So we, there's a balance between the direct pathway and indirect pathway, as I said, but there's also an increasing a hypothesis um, which has been proved that there is there seems to be a hyper direct pathway which connects the motor cortex directly to the subthalamic um, nuclei. So the in, essentially the intrinsic circuitry in the basal ganglia is much much more complex than we ever thought um, with greater interconnectivity between nuclei and if you think of dystonia as a disorder of a distributed network disorder, then it could be one node which is affected, one node being the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, the thalamus, or it could be multiple nodes in this network, or even more co complicated, it could be the fibers connecting the various nodes which could be affected. So essentially, it becomes very, very complicated, um, and it's not just a simple issue of a problem with the basal ganglia. The genetics of dystonia, um, there used to be 10, 30 genes before, and now it's over 100 genes now identified, and it's expanding um, every, every day. But the problem is, if you have look at the multiple genes, they seem to have some shared molecular and cellular pathways. But the problem is the genetic heterogeneity and the phenotypic pleiotropy, where one gene could have many clinical expressions and many genes can cause one disorder. But you can, using the genetic knowledge, you can classify these various conditions into different patterns of inheritance, for example, which would be um, helpful with counseling, et cetera. But more useful is if you classify them using the various biological pathways. So using the genetic information, we can stratify these various conditions on biologically meaningful categories which would help in the management. The highlighted ones are the ones where dystonia is uh, the predominant um, problem. So biological categories into disorders of dopamine signaling, cation transporter problems, heavy metal accumulation, and mitochondrial um, dysfunction. The, the problem, as I um, pointed out earlier, is the my problem with treatment, because most of the anti-dystonia medications that we use have got a huge incidence of adverse reactions. So this is the data from 278 children treated at the Evelina Children's Hospital um, in Guys and St. Thomas. They looked at the 278 children um, and found that the adverse reactions were present in 61% uh, percent of referrals, and the most common, as we probably all know from our practice, being with trihexyphenidyl, baclofen, and um, levodopa. So this is not a happy situation where they manage, it, it is quite refractory to the treatment, plus you have to deal with all these adverse effects. Now, um, 
I won't go into the detail with the EGS medications, but um, levodopa, um, we know it's very effective in dopa-responsive um, dystonia. We give it with carbidopa in order to prevent the peripheral conversion. The doses um, can be quite effective from low doses. Often you see a clear benefit, benefit in patients with a few days of starting the, uh, starting the therapy. But the side effects, uh, which are quite common, uh, includes nausea, lightheadedness, dizziness, hallucinations, and confusion. Now, there used to be an adage um, that every child exhibiting dystonia merits an L-DOPA trial, um, lest the potentially treatable condition of DOPA-responsive dystonia is missed. Now, I'm not sure whether this still uh, holds um, true. And there's a bit of history behind that, because the reason why levodopa was used was because it was found helpful in Parkinson's. And then it was in 1976 when Dr. Sagawa, who presented a poster at the first ICNA Congress um, of the six uh, children with dysto dystonia, who responded to uh, dopa. And it was about 20, 30 years later when the GTP cyclohydrolase one was identified, and that was, so somehow with this historical background, it seemed to, this adage seemed to hold fast uh, with levodopa being tried. But the problem is, there is the potential harmful effects of levodopa should not be underestimated. And we know that there's a large inter individual variation in the dose, and also even with DYT11, you know, you can get paradoxical worsening of dystonia upon initiation of L-dopa, prompting the physician to sometimes stop it and to never try it again. And there isn't really any randomized placebo-controlled trial to establish the significance of a levodopa trial. So, you know, as the American Academy of Pediatrics says, um, the, it should not be the label indication, but the evidence which should remain the gold standard. And we know that the dopa-responsive dystonias only comprise a few percent of early onset dystonia. So, the, I, I, I'm still not sure whether the old adage still holds good. I suppose if there is a lower limb, isolated lower limb dystonia, and if there is a definite diurnal variation, then certainly there is an indication for a trial of levodopa. Otherwise, in this era of genetic testing, et cetera, we might be able to refine our approach further rather than um, blanket trial of levodopa. And there are loads of conditions where we know that the levodopa can improve the situation or where it may not improve the situation. And that not necessarily mean they're all dopa-responsive dystonias. Gabapentin is yet another medication which has come of use and which is our go-to medication, um, um, particularly in our practice in the, in the UK. Now, there is a reason for that. As I alluded to earlier, it is the increasing role of the somatosensory inputs in case of dystonia because we know about these sensory tricks, and we know that gabapentin works very well for peripheral nerve pain. And it is from this sort of thinking where, the, the, where we thought that the gabapentin might be helpful in, in dystonia. Um, and surprisingly, it, it does. Um, and the dose is much, much higher, and sometimes we have to use up to 60 or sometimes even up to 90 milligrams per kilogram per day of um, gabapentin, um, but uh, it, often, it often works. Um, clonidine is the another go-to drug, particularly in the uh, situation of uh, status dystonicus. Um, it's a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. So clonidine and gabapentin are the two drugs which are increasingly used um, for uh, dystonia, a move away from our old um, go-to drugs of trihexyphenidyl and uh, baclofen mainly because of the adverse effects uh, associated with anticholinergic drugs and the antidopaminergic drugs. Tetrabenacin is helpful only in the uh, situation of chorea, and benzodiazepines and anticonvulsants are still used, but again, uh, issues with respiratory depression, et cetera, limit their use. And when you come talk about pharmacotherapy these days, like, you know, it's never complete without mention of um, cannabis. Um, and there is a recent... Um, Pilot trial from Tel Aviv, uh, where Lipson and colleagues compared two products of cannabidiol, um, and uh, they found that it improved spasticity and dystonia. But these are all early, early days, and we know that it helps spasticity to some extent. Um, but as to whether cannabis is still a, uh, as a treatment for a dystonia, um, we have to we have to wait and uh, see. Perhaps you know it will um, by the looks of things, as we have seen with epilepsy. 
So when all these things have failed, the thing which has come to become the mainstay of dystonia management is deep brain stimulation. And even though it is not new and has been in use for almost 20 years, essentially it's implantation of electrodes into the deep substance of the brain connected to an implant pulse generator delivering high frequency stimulation to the targeted brain region. So, and sometimes the, uh, the results can be quite amazing. Um, as we can see in this boy who, um, before, before and after um, uh, deep, brain, deep brain stimulation. So sometimes the, it, can, it can be a miracle, um, deep brain, deep brain stimulation. It can also help when you have a particular genetic mutation, and like this boy with GNAO1 mutation, um, who again can be quite miraculous in, in, its, in its response. But that is only in a primary dystonias or the isolated monogenic dystonias. When it comes to secondary dystonias, or uh, the right terminology would be symptomatic dystonias, the ones which are associated with cerebral palsy and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy like we saw in the last session, the, it's, disappoint, it's slightly disappointing, the response to deep brain stimulation. But uh, this is, again, the Evelina cohort, um, where the non-progressive dystonia cases had the worst motor function. Um, um, now, there might be a reason for this, because often with these sort of dystonia, secondary dystonias, they don't come to the movement disorder clinic up until much later, perhaps in when they are aged 10 to 12, where, where the fixed musculoskeletal deformities are already set in. Because as we know that, unlike the primary dystonias, the children with secondary dystonias never had any period of normal muscle development, uh, motor development. Um, in which cases, which means by the time they are aged five or six, the fixed musculoskeletal deformity had set in, and which obviously is going to affect your um, outcome um, in uh, following deep brain stimulation. 50% of the children had secondary dystonia had some form of musculoskeletal deformity, and by 13, they rise to 80%. So ideally, we ought to be catching these children quite early which is another very important thing when it comes to dystonia, uh, recent advances in dystonia, which is the increasing thinking that uh, spasticity is not the overwhelming problem in cerebral palsy. Um, and we, we, when you start looking at spasticity as just an, a velocity-dependent catch, and if you, look, then if you start looking at it that way, then you will realize that you know, the dystonia element is a huge um, factor in cerebral palsy children, which should prompt you for early referral um, and management. And perhaps if that was the case, then we wouldn't be seeing uh, poor outcomes in secondary dystonias as we see, see now. This was this. This was the. Um, uh, this is the uh, cohort from our our practice in 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 Bristol. Um, again, secondary dystonias, cerebral palsy is the is the major um, component um, compared to the primary dystonias. Now, the problem with deep brain stimulation is um, the focus has been, as I said, on patient selection. So the surgeons, in order to improve their numbers, uh, would always want to operate on. The, um, on the primary dystonias, because as we've seen, it is miraculous uh, response, and not much on secondary dy dystonia. So the focus has always been on in patient selection. Patient selection is very important to um, get your DBS uh, working. But the other thing which has come into recent years is it's not just the patient selection, it is also the choice of target, because we now know that it's not just the basal ganglia nuclei, we know the cerebellum is involved, we know the thalamic nuclei are involved, but the problem is, how do we, how do we decide which word to stimulate? Because almost 100% of our children had the globus pallidus interna stimulated. Um, we hardly ever uh, stimulate any other organs. We now know that the cortico, striato, pallido, thalamic, cortico circuits, so the CSPTC, are known to be arranged. There are parallel streams um, in the globus pallidus where 
the, the posteriorly in the putamen, you have the motor circuits, middle you have the associative circuits, the executive circuits, and anteriorly you have the limbic circuits. You wouldn't want to, the, the, the stream that you want to focus would be in the motor circuits, which are posteriorly in the, in, from the, in the connecting the putamen to the cortex. So those are the areas which we need to, we need to stimulate. But the problem is, conventional um, MRIs are not going to show you the tracks, um, which is where the new modalities of diffusion MRI tractography has come, where 3D models of motor white matter pathways can be generated from um, diffusion MRI, most, um, most commonly DTI, but there are also other modalities. So you could have tracked proximity um, analysis, you could have tracked activation modeling, or you could have direct tracked targeting. So there are, using these 3D uh, techniques, using DTI images, you can, you can um, focus on the tracks. The uh, Terry Sanger at the Children's Hospital, LA, LA Children's Hospital, they actually use um, microelectrode recording. Um, it is a bit labor intensive because these children have to have multiple surgeries where microelectrodes are implanted first and then they are stimulated. It's not stimulated to find out the actual response because even with globus pallidus interna stimulation, you don't see the response for several weeks. But what you can identify is you can increase the voltage and see whether there are any side effects. And if there are no side effects and if they are tolerating that particular voltage, then they can go ahead and implant permanent electrodes. But they have also, um, and using, for example, here, they can see that the GPI and the ventral intermedial nucleus in the thalamus seems to correspond to the biceps and the triceps electromyographs, so which then enables them to target a, another area. There was a case report which was published recently by Terry Sanger's group. Um, where they could, they could, instead of the GPI, they could actually target the VIM uh, nucleus. Um, so it's a more, more precision delivery of the DBS. But it's also important that we, our focus should not be on just managing the motor symptoms. We should always remember the known motor symptoms as well, abnormalities in the sensory and perceptual functions, the neuropsychotic disturbances, and particularly sleep. And there's a whole symposia devoted to this at the um, ICNC in Mumbai um, in, in, in November. It again, we use the Burke uh, Fan Mask then dystonia rating scale, uh, um, the motor scale for assessment of dystonia. And we judge our improvement in the DBS outcome by looking at the BFM DRS scores. But does the BFM DRS scores actually correlate with the GMFCS and the MACS? We don't know because uh, it doesn't seem to be, uh, particularly with the max grades. And the, which suggests that known dystonic variables impair the manual ability. So we should not be. We should be looking at a child as a whole when you look at outcome, rather than just the management of the motor motor symptoms. The problem is we don't have any biomarkers. We use central motor conduction time latency as um, as a as a, a biomarker to look at the integrity of the white matter tracks to see whether the deep brain stimulation will be good or bad, uh, because if the white matter integrity is not there in the child, and the, the deep brain stimulation is not going to be helpful. But how do you look at the integrity of the white matter tracks? One way of looking at is using um, fractional anisotropy. As you know, fractional anisotropy values can vary from one to zero depending on the water diffusion. If it is zero, that means there are no fibers. Water can diffuse everywhere. If it is one, that means water can diffuse along the track. So that is a useful marker of connectivity. And the group in uh, JP Lin's group in Evelina has done some work on uh, this was Dan Lumsden's PhD on um, fractional anisotropy values in DBS. And they have shown that the FA values are high in primary dystonias, as the green lines indicate, while the red is the the, the blue is the primary dystonias, and the red is the, the children who had intrathecal baclofen instead of DBS. There is a bit of overlap, as you can see, but using fractional anisotropy values, we can predict how the DBS is going to come out. So importantly, we have which child, um, and then what target, and where in the target. So that's the, 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 the way it seems to be going now in terms of deep brain stimulation, which is the only real therapy for these movement disorders, um, given all the pharmacotherapies have failed. Um, I will stop you. I won't go into status dystonic. Thank you.
So that was really uh, exciting, the new areas of treatment that are coming up. So I think um, uh, the audience would have a question or two. Maybe uh, another mention of uh, on the vaccine, on this. Uh, botulinum toxin, especially in children who come with dystonia. Yes, like I said, you know, if, the, if we are focusing on the func function and yes. sometimes in uh, focal dystonias, yes, Botox it can, be, can be very, very helpful. So essentially it's taking away the reflex, isn't it? So um, if, if that helps with function and if that helps with seating, etc., then yes, it is good, but it doesn't actually treat the the underlying pathology, isn't it? But yeah. yes, it can be very helpful in specific patient population. Especially early in the period of Absolutely. life rather yeah. than waiting for a long exactly. period of time. So uh, in interest of time, I think we'll wind up. If there are any questions, that you can ask over tea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amit.